Hey guys, so I was thinking about a few scenarios to try to help all of us think outside the box. Let's imagine a scenario where you're arguing about border control and immigration. Um, rather than just, you know, go back and forth and argue about all sorts of the same issues, try to envision a scenario where you're trying to cripple another country's budget. What you could do is round up all the people in your mental asylums, all, your, all of your homeless people, and basically give them passports, inject them with some sort of sedative, ketamine, I'm not sure what else is out there, but you know, people in, in asylums and people who are homeless don't have any advocates, at least not on a continuous basis. So it's not far-fetched to believe that you could, you know, simply round them up, and to use very blunt language, and give them passports, put them on a plane, and send them over to, to some other place across the ocean or, or probably not across the border. Um, you know, you probably have too many cameras, but what you could do is take them into a less developed airport or one that uh, just doesn't have security cameras everywhere. You come in, you leave them there, you do it over a two-year period, and you basically come back by yourself. You take the person's passport, and you just leave them there. If you do this with, say, 10,000 people, you have increased your own budget, your own country's budget, uh, for perhaps more productive things, and decreased the other person's capacity to deal with crime and a lot of other issues, like social welfare. Um, what's going to happen is you might think, well, you know, number one, that's immoral, number two, you'll be found out. Um, let's take it a step further. So now we're in, in a pandemic, we have COVID-19. So most of us wear masks. Uh, it wouldn't be out of the question for, for somebody to conceal his identity very completely with a ski mask of some sort. Nobody would, it wouldn't look out of the ordinary. So even if you have cameras, what you could do is you could go in, um, you know, to countries that do not require a, um, a, a visa application in advance. Uh, that have 30 days or two weeks visa travel, and then go in and do the same thing um, and only remove the mask either at the airport check-in or at, a, at another location um, once you're away from the airport and away from cameras. It's not a perfect system, right, uh, if, if you happen to be... But you can do it with enough people uh, from different countries as well uh, so that, you know, when the person goes ahead of you, um, you know, you can go, you know, and you're, the, you're next to that person. You can explain that this person is, you know, it, it, well, they're on sedatives, but is, you know, it's really kind of, you know, didn't, wasn't, wasn't able to sleep on the plane. That's why I'm, I'm going to help answer all the questions for this person. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm here to take care of the person. So, you know, worst case, they might be able to go back and, you know, connect you with that person. But uh, if you do it with different people, um, you know, you still have what's called plausible deniability. And again, the objective here is, is to try to cripple the other person's country. You can see right away how, you know, number one, why people are concerned about borders. Because all countries are, are not only concerned about spending on social welfare. Uh, we'll talk about why that's not necessarily, you know, the best way to look at it uh, in, a, in, a, in a few minutes. But, you know, people are also concerned about attracting the best people. And, it's, and like most of life, it's a, mom, it's a momentum game. If you attract the best people, that's actually what universities are for. You know, it, it multiplies. There's a multiplier effect that comes with that. It's, it's the other way around as well. If you attract too many criminals, too many poor people, um, too many uh, irresponsible people, there's also a multiplier effect to the extent that the poverty is not, you know, something that's, you know, that's something that um, is, is accidental uh, or, you know, something that's a result of a poorly planned economy and so on. So right away, we see that if you are somebody that favors a more open immigration policy, there are some issues to consider. Let's think about it another way. Uh, you are in a country uh, that is causing wars all over the world. Uh, as a result, there are many refugees in other countries. Uh, your own country is protected by two oceans. Uh, so you're relatively safe from uh, you know, any sort of, kind of cross-border um, infusion of refugees uh, that are involved in, that are the result of distant wars 
that you are either funding directly or, in, or indirectly. If you're in the other, in the target country that's been the victim of a war, um, what you could do is, if you understand the, you know, the country that's across the ocean, what you could do is try to figure out what the administration wants, and then you can, if you're, say, in a country that has a large Catholic population, you can probably try to get a lot of people within that country who are not Catholic. You can, you can give them a primer on Catholicism, uh, maybe even change their name on some documents, and then, you know, send them over, you know, through a liaison with the U.S. government, even if they're not Catholic. Now, so suddenly there's, there's some really interesting issues, right? Because the same, you know, sort of lax or the same open, the same loophole or the same hole that allows you to do the first thing also allows you to save a lot of people uh, who, for, you know, for the most part are in a circumstance that's beyond their control. And not only that, but this in this case, it's probably not immoral because you're essentially, you know, shifting the costs um, uh, the, of social welfare onto the country that is directly benefiting or indirectly benefiting from it, even though it's through a lie. So, it's another example to think about. Uh, now, what does all this really mean? There's another example that I had thought about um, and that one is something that, that might uh, that, that escapes me at the moment. Um, but let's see if I can you know, re-summon it. Um, you know, those, those, the first two examples are, are pretty interesting. Um, you know, wh whatever side of the of the, of the uh, debate that you're on. Um, you know, you, you've got a situation where let's take the first example. Uh, you can see how there's there's even potentially larger problems uh, if you, now we're in the pandemic, if you actually inf infect the people that you're going to take into another country with COVID-19, with, with a virus, um, or you have a, you don't, you know, in other words, you wait until they are, you know, in the country, you inject them with a virus, and then you leave them there. Now you've got a serious problem, and you've got a situation where a lot of people are now um, you know, can probably see quite clearly how, you know, why so many people are concerned about things like border walls or and immigration and why it has really sort of captured the imagination of politicians and voters in developed countries. The problem with all this is that we're not looking at anything the right way. Um, the other example just occurred to me is what if you have an example, you know, this, this, you know, have a new example. Let's say you wanted to have a situation where you had tourism coming in from your neighbors. Uh, you had a, a situation where as long as the child is born in the United States or some other country, um, you know, the child becomes a citizen. And at that point, you know, you can simply take the child back with you. Uh, if, you know, a lot of neighboring you know, states allow each other to stay six months or three months, um, it's not out of the question, I think, that if, if, it's, if you come in the wintertime, put on a coat, uh, that you could probably st you know, go through Im immigration undetected, um, you know, or, even if, or at least, you know, sort of, you know, come in and overstay your visa, your automatic visa. And at that point, you have the child, you then now have dual citizenship, you go back to your country, and you have a way out. You know, in case one government fails or becomes corrupt, uh, you're able to escape to a different place. Is that immoral? Is that something that we should be concerned about? It's certainly happening. Um, and again, explains why a lot of people are concerned about the immigration issue. Um, the other issue might simply be that, you know, somebody goes across the border and has a child and then simply stays. Um, and then, you know, now here, here's where it gets kind of interesting because the U.S. Citizen, citizen child is entitled to welfare, but not the mother. But the only way that you can really, you know, administer the welfare to the child is through the mother. And so now that puts you in all kinds of problem, you know, problematic scenarios, right? If the mother is arrested uh, and has to be deported, what happens to the child? Maybe there's a child going to foster care. If the child does go into foster care, that's a much worse scenario for everyone involved. They're separating families. Um, you know, you're probably spending more than you would if you simply, uh, you know, administered welfare directly to that two-unit person, uh, family. 
Um, so again, there's all sorts of these interesting issues to discuss, but the problem is that no one's thinking outside the box. Um, with respect to birthright citizen citizenship, the real question we ought to be asking is, why don't more countries have it? If more countries had it, then we could, they could, you know, we as individuals would not only be able to move a little bit farther away from nationalism, but, you know, it would force countries to compete. So let's say right now, if you, um, you know, if, if you had a country that was that had to treat people, uh, you know, regardless of income, uh, if they showed up at a hospital, uh, if you had that in one country but but not another, you could see how there could be problems, right? You know, people would simply go from you know one country to the next um, if they if the if the healthcare system within their country wasn't as good as the other one, and that would you know harm in some cases, right? The other country's system because you know on the one hand. You may not, the person receiving treatment may not be paying taxes, and so on and so forth. There's a couple of problems with that scenario. One of them is that almost every institution, at least the hospitals, are nonprofits. Um, they already receive an economic advantage. No one thinks the healthcare um, system today is particularly very good or very efficient. Um, and so, you know, and furthermore, a lot of these, you know, a lot of the healthcare systems receive money from governments in order to, to function. Um, and so the question is, you know, that money doesn't necessarily come from taxes anymore. It comes from a lot of other things. Um, and if you look at the budget, the United States has had two multi-trillion dollar bailouts within the last 20 years. And so the question is, if you want to really get into it, Money is, is, you know, and budgeting are obviously important, but the fact that the, that the United States is able to sort of print money um, tells you that it's doing so in order to maintain its lead in, say, space, war, defense weapons, a lot of data, AI, quantum, um, you know, mechanics, and a lot of other things. And so what the economic model is today, post-World War II, it's completely different from a taxpayer-funded system that we're used to thinking about, uh, that used to exist before World War II. Today, in most leading countries, you know the the way the economy economy really works is that it's a trickle-down economy. You have a one entity that has an unlimited budget. Basically, that's the military. The budget keeps going up every year, uh, whether directly in the budget or through uh, appropriations, um, and you create a leadership position and then you export that leadership position to other countries. So in other words, the whole world starts financing uh, and benefiting from your invention uh, because you're not a leader in that, you know, through immigration, you've attracted the best people, you've got the best universities in order to do that. Uh, you're able to, in some cases, spy on, on a lot of other countries, make sure they're not trying to leapfrog you, um, and, you know, and, and so on. So the problem, again, with that model is that, you know, you can see that you know, it, it creates an inside-outside, an arbitrary inside-outside, um, you know, economic system. Um, and furthermore, it runs on debt. It doesn't does not run on, you know, taxes. So the unfortunate problem with all this, right, is that the are people making the argument that you know, well, people should pay taxes. You know, they have a, they're correct uh, from a philosophical point of view because you don't, you know, it, it, you do want some sort of limits somewhere. Um, and, and you do want a connection between services and products and payment in some way to create a relationship that, that is just supposed to be a feedback loop, right? If I receive services uh, and I'm paying for it, I care more about it. If I live in that community, I care more about what goes on in those schools. If I'm, uh, if I'm particular, particularly ambitious or diligent, I may have some ideas on how to fix things. And then, the, and then in that case, if, if there's a real problem, I can get my community together and we can all try to offer some more solutions. And if that doesn't work, we can vote out the city council. None of that happens anymore. Um, people are too busy. City councils are pretty much dominant, dominant, you know, at least run by money from real estate developers and government unions. And the government unions do receive taxes and then they turn around and then negotiate with the politicians. Uh, you know, they negotiate eight year contracts, six year contracts with politicians that are oftentimes only there for two years or four years. And so it's not an equal bargaining position. And those taxes that, be, that people are paying, in many cases, are being used to stack the deck against the individual in favor of uh, police unions, teachers unions, and a lot of other groups that don't necessarily have the individual or the consumer 
um, or the student in mind. So you see a lot of fragmentation, but you know the, the important thing to realize is that we're far beyond this sort of idea that taxes and payment of taxes uh, does that you know creates a civilization. It's actually debt that creates modern civilization based on this export model um, uh, and trickle down economy that creates a leadership position using debt, almost certainly in technology, wipes out the competition, um, and then uses that debt to create a, lead a leadership position and then a, a marketing position that is worldwide through you know, through data control, um, through control of you know the internet, uh, through control of the infrastructure of the internet, to tell us the cell phones, uh, a lot of other data that we use um, you know every day, and at that point creates a leadership position worldwide that you know has the other country uh, paying debt back to the, to the to the United States in U.S. dollars in order to get access to this technology and and all of the benefits. Whether or not it's necessary, once again, that's why you have the marketing arm worldwide, television, Disney, all these things. And, and at some point, you, you know, if you are in a democratic system, it's quite easy to, you know, replace people, uh, whether by force, if you have a high military system, a, a, an efficient military system, or you can do it by force through a coup, uh, which is what the U.S. is trying to do now in Venezuela um, and has tried to, and has actually done before in Iran. Both countries have oil. Um, you know, that, that U.S. dollar, that ability to print the money, of course, comes, comes from a near monopolistic position in oil, which is something that's necessary all over the world. It doesn't have to be necessary, but it, it is today. Um, so you look at all these things and you notice very quickly how the economy and borders and all these things, they're all completely divorced from morality um, and from responsibility. And, you know, that's really the heart of the problem. So let's talk about these other scenarios that we just uh, discussed. Now, why not have d dual citizenship? What's the real problem with that if it forces people to compete? We just talked about the issue about welfare. You know, one person, you know, if, if I'm in the U.S. and I have Canadian citizenship, uh, I can go to Canada and use their system and then come back to the, to the U.S. I'm not paying into the system. The reality is that the Canada is under the U.S. umbrella um, uh, in terms of the economy, in terms of shipment of oil, military protection. And so this, this sort of facade of a border, it exists perhaps in our imagination. It's there, but for the most part, you know, it, it exists more thoroughly in our imagination. They have their own laws, but a lot of those laws are, are you know, are actually the same as, or similar to the, to the United States outside of Quebec, um, you know, you can see very quickly how once you're under a security umbrella uh, or an alliance, especially when one of those members of the alliance has an almost unlimited budget, you can see how there's a tendency to make everyone below um, that budget into a satellite that resembles the leading country at the time. Um, and you can see that now, you know, the United States obviously has policing problems uh, with respect to African Americans, but so does Australia. Not African Americans, but their own, you know, the, the First Nations people. Same thing on Canada. And it's, in fact, it's so similar, that there has to be a connection. And, you know, Australia is quite far away from the U.S., but again, very similar dynamic that indicates the military culture and the spending has trickled down into the police departments. And so suddenly you have these borders, but not really. And in reality, you've got a scenario where, you know, investors want security, they want stability. And the real problem with somebody saying, well, you know, you've got a situation where, um, you know, oh, by the way, um, you know, the police departments reflect the kind of country you're in. So if you're in a country that's racist, the police departments will probably be racist as well. It's not as if the police are separate from the people they serve. Uh, in, in most cases, they are a better reflection of the country than the politicians, because the politicians can say whatever they want. But the police are actually the ones on the ground floor. Uh, they're the ones with boots on the ground. So they, are, they have more access to, what's, to, to, to knowledge about what's going on in the whole community, as opposed to perhaps the university or a small section of the community, which is where the politicians might be more comfortable hanging out, especially if they're lawyers. So... Let's talk about, you know, this idea of predictability and stability, which influences investment decisions, which then contributes to that leadership position worldwide on that export model. 
Un under the presumption that, by the way, you know, post World War II, if, if, if the U.S. made the best bridges, it made sense to rebuild Japan and Germany with that technology and that know how and that supply chain uh, and that quality control. Um, but things are obviously not working out because today Germany and Japan have a better transportation system, public transportation system, than the U.S. In terms of, even in private um, transportation, you know, I, I, Germany is probably better in some ways. So there's a problem here. Um, and so when you talk about taxes, you're talking about making society a better place with input. That, that those taxes are supposed to give you input, but it doesn't actually work that way. Um, there's been all, all these special interest groups that capture it before it can really you know, do anything, especially if you live in a country like the U.S. where you have all these trillion dollar obligations that are set to, you know, to, 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 uh, to rise um, in 10 to 20 years when a large portion of the government uh, retires um, and then is entitled to um, benefits under a separate system than the general population. So when, when people are concerned about, say, well, what if I have dual citizenship? And if I go to this other country, um, you know, I might, I might overwhelm the school system. Well, the f first question we want to ask ourselves is, you know, if we're in this position today with massive in inequality, uh, with politicians that are, for the most part, not very um, helpful, what is the real value of that education system, of that public education system? Is it zero? Is it less than zero? Um, you know, is it really a jobs program for native-born citizens? Is that really the primary purpose, which explains why the system is geared more towards the whims of the teachers rather than the students? And to the extent that it's a good system, why do so many people who can afford it put their kids in schools that cost, you know, from primary all the way up to, you know, college? Well, I just call the colleges in the U.S. are fantastic, so I, I, public ones, uh, many of them are. So we'll just go through high school. A lot of parents pay $10,000 to $30,000 a year to put their kids in private schools. To the extent that this public school system that you're so worried about, um, that you're, that you're about protecting from outsiders, to the extent that it's any good, why is it that so many people within the United States and a lot of other countries will pay so much money to avoid it? In, in other words, subjecting them themselves to double taxation. We're already paying taxes. You can see, by the way, how there's contempt for taxes. But if you're paying into a private system that you still have to pay for a public system, of course you're going to minimize you know, all the taxes you can and, and utilize all the, t all the loopholes you can. Um, especially if, the, if you know, the private system is working better than the public system. And now there's another issue, right? Why do private systems work better than public systems sometimes? And one of the reasons is because, reasons is because multinational corporations are, are, again, multinational. They're international. And so they have an advantage because they're sucking up knowledge and data from all over the world. Whereas governments, you know, are, are only capturing data and systems and knowledge from people that have been there for a long time um, and typically are, are only very good at doing one thing within a local system. Um, or if it's a national system, you know, doing it very poorly because there's just too much information um, and too many pre-existing obligations. Um, and so one of the reasons you can fix that is if people have dual, dual citizenship. If they suddenly, the governments become automatically or, or inherently multinational. And so they also have a better way of connecting people with each other. So you can, you can imagine, you know, in say all of North and South America, having everyone pick two countries. When they were born, you can have that citizenship. And then, you know, you can have one more citizenship within that whole area. And you can see, you know, number one, why that would create a lot of issues uh, for governments, but not necessarily for people. Um, and so, you know, the, the point of this discussion, you know, is to sort of realize that, you know, there are other ways of looking at these things and that our reflexive instincts when we analyze these sorts of border control issues and, uh, and immigration issues, they're very, for the most part talking about a world as it is and a world that quite frankly, politically is failing all, all over rather than the world as, as it should be. And one of those things, again, is that, that, that idea about birthright citizenship, about, you know, dual citizenship, and, and there are so many other things about the fact that people are concerned about their school system failing or becoming overburdened. Well, if you have somebody who comes in from Mexico and you have a Spanish program, why wouldn't it be the case that the school system might actually get better? Um, in some cases, the teacher might be from Spain, might speak Castilian Spanish, but, you know, if, you're, if you want to go to Mexico, it might be a little different. Even Argentina might be even more different. 
why isn't it that we're th not thinking, when we think about government services, why are we not thinking about the government in the same way that we're thinking about multinational corporations? Because if you have one entity, the private sector, that is multinational, and, is, and as a result is able to get data and access to systems worldwide, and is being regulated by a bunch of people that are only local, how is that going to work? Isn't it obvious what the scenario or the result will be over time? And this has happened before. Look at the British Empire. The uh, British um, East India Company at one point had a bigger military than the British government itself and was collecting taxes in Bengal in India. The, I mean, there are so many, so many problems with the way that we think about things, um, whether it's taxation or anything else. You can, you know, you can see so many scenarios, but the fact of the matter is now that we have surveillance, now that we don't have much privacy anymore because of technology and because of the monopolization of a lot of this technology by the leaders within that group, you know, you can argue that, you know, a lot of these reasons for enforcing borders, is, is, are, they're obviously legitimate, but if you have facial recognition, this shouldn't be that difficult to track people, right? In other words, you want borders so you can track people, so you can, you know, keep your, your own people, your own your own people within those borders safer. But one, you know, one of the reasons you want those borders is so you can track people within them easier. But if you have facial recognition te technology everywhere, um, you know, the, the real problem at that point becomes how much you want to spend on welfare, uh, how much of that budget is going to be allocated to people that are, you know, perhaps not as productive as they otherwise could be. And here's a problem with welfare. I'm, um, you know, I've got somebody across the hall from me here, and he's a kind, kindly person. He's not very old. Uh, he might be 50, uh, 55 maybe, 60 at the most. Uh, he sleeps all day, and at lunchtime, somebody comes in every day and, and puts a little plastic bag with a, you know, a homemade meal for him uh, on, on his door. And if he's sleeping, or sometimes the door is open, so they just give it to him. Um, sometimes it's delivered by an individual. Sometimes it's, deli it's delivered by one of these, um, you know, companies that delivers food for everyone, not just people on uh, on social assistance. Once a week, uh, somebody comes in and helps him clean, uh, has, has a conversation with him, um, and so on. Um, but for the most part, he spends his time on his phone. Uh, I'm in a humid place. Uh, that's why the doors are open, so you can kind of see through. Uh, if you walk up and down the hall, um, which I do a lot because it's, it's one of my way of getting exercise um, and during this pandemic. So you, most of the time he's sleeping or he's watching TV. He's got a fancy TV, better than the one um, that, that I have. I don't watch TV, uh, you know, so except, you know, for Netflix and all that on my laptop. Um, so is that really, if you're thinking about welfare, is that what you want? Or is it really the fact that we're discussing welfare because we can't provide people with better jobs? So the man is actually really nice. He's smart. Um, well, I offered him some tea, and he came back the next day and gave me a whole, you know, it's like he gave me some ice cream, and I mean, stuff that I hadn't seen before. Uh, I mean, he actually has given us, uh, or given me, uh, some gifts as well. Um, you know, every time we give him something, you know, um, you know, the, the house, he comes back and he gives us something as well. Uh, smart guy, but spends almost all day sleeping. Um, that can't be what welfare was meant to do. So are we discussing welfare, you know, in a way that's not, you know, are all the jobs in this country, you know, taken? I mean, is, is, or are we not able to have him create a scenario where he can be more useful? Do you think that people like being in this situation? Uh, well, you know, no. Were they sleeping half a day and watching TV the other half? Probably not. So the question is, why do we have a system? It's because it just happens to be the system that we have. We have a government. The government then contracts out on, on, a, on a welfare basis. Nobody wants to see starving people, so this guy gets food. Somebody gets paid for it, suddenly you have an economy. So someone's getting a job, right? Even though the system isn't working. Because that's the point of all these programs, is to create jobs. Uh, not necessarily to make the system better or optimal. So one of the things you people are concerned about within these scenarios of more immigration and so on is, well, number one, uh, you know, welfare systems would collapse. Well, you can actually cut welfare. Um, and then that will force people to, you know, uh, rely on private organizations more. I'm not sure that's what you want, unless you want a rise in religious influence. Um, but you can also see it as just a failure of the government. Uh, this, this idea that the government has ceded not only intellectualism to the religious sector, 
um, you know, and, but also just just sort of the creation of of, of welfare jobs, uh, of welfare assistance, you know, simply exceeded that territory simply by failing to create good jobs. And I don't know if I'm being too optimistic, but I don't see a problem with somebody sitting down with this man. Um, I'm not qualified, I, I, you know, here, but you know, I don't see a problem with somebody sitting down from the government and saying instead of just dropping off some food for him or seeing him once a week. Ask the guy, what do you want to do? You know, you watch TV. I mean, is, is there something you can do? Maybe, you know, there's got to be something, a review, a book. Um, you know, if he doesn't want to do that, if he can't read or write, he can. But, if you know, if he can't, um, you know, there's so many things, you know, do you want to have, you know, by the way, there's smokers in the hall here. People smoke all the time. No one cleans it except once once a month, I think. Um, uh, you know, maybe you want to just get paid. Uh, to go ahead and, and, you know, sort of clean the hallways more than once a month. And what tools do you need? How can we subsidize that? How do we make it worth our while? Um, and people, you know, they like uniforms. They like, you know, titles. Maybe not uniforms so much, but titles, right? They, they like responsibility. Um, you know, do you want to make food? You know, if, if, you, know you, if you know how to cook, maybe we can have a, somebody teach you how to cook. There's YouTube videos or whatnot, and then maybe we can have a competition, um, you know, the power of television and, and, and the internet is that you can make anybody famous, but we're making people famous for the wrong reasons. Um, you can actually have, like, you know, give everybody their 15 minutes of fame, uh, but in, in ways that, you know, max, it sort of maximizes their, um, not optimism, but their passion. Uh, you can see how that's a better system, perhaps, than what the one we have now. So everything, every time we talk about welfare, you've got to think, why are we talking about this? Why aren't we talking about a better system that creates better jobs for everybody? everyone so we're not in this scenario um so that's been so i have all these so i started out with all these hypotheticals and i want to show you that even within these hypotheticals once you start getting into the, into the strata the substrata we're still not thinking about things the right way uh there's obviously a better way of doing things but the system in place is soaked in debt and so it's fighting to survive in order to maintain the status quo but it's not as if the status quo is good for anybody and the status quo as it is is turning people against each other um, as opposed to maximizing our potential. Uh, and the question is, why aren't more people sort of thinking outside the box? Because you can see there are no right answers. There are only there are better answers and worse answers, but all of them require um, you to be interested in people as, in, as individuals. Uh, and the question is, you know, how do we sort of create a budget um, or, or to create spending uh, that doesn't divide populations? Because that's where we're going at this point, uh, especially if the status quo stays, stays the way it is. And tries to increase at the expense of, of 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 other newcomers, and that in the private sector is if it doesn't happen as often, um, right? Because if you have a new way of doing things, uh, typically people want it, they can pay for it, that succeeds, it takes off, um, and then you know people then have to deal with it. And what's happened really is that technology and surveillance are so far beyond the grasp of most politicians that. Uh, the, the balance of regulation and innovation has become so lopsided that the casualty has been the individual.